Welcome to Life on Planet Earth with John Aiden Byrne. My guest coming up is from the world of professional baseball. Todd Stottlemyre rose to superstardom, winning two World Series with the Toronto Blue Jays, yet still had to reach his true peak in the journey that began afterwards. And if you look at my childhood, you know, I grew up in a place called Yankee Stadium with my father, Mel Stottlemyre, who was a legend and a legendary pitcher for the New York Yankees. So growing up at the stadium and having a dream and then living it out. And I'm not only living it out now, I'm playing on great teams that are winning world championships. I'm in my 20s. I'm making millions of dollars. And if you would have looked at me from the outside, you'd have been like, this guy's got it all. I mean, had a dream, grew up in Yankee Stadium, living out the dream, winning world championships, making millions. He's in his 20s. There was a problem, John. And the, and the problem for me was when I looked in the mirror, I couldn't stand the guy looking back at me. A voyage of discovery in an uncommon age of unparalleled scientific, economic, political, and social upheaval, life on planet Earth searches for the unvarnished truth answers, solutions, and above all, hope for our existential crisis. Todd Stottlemyre has a new book out, The Observer. It is highly personal and transformative and offers actionable strategies for professional and personal growth. And it is also the fable of Todd Stottlemyre's remarkable journey and life as a three-time World Series champion. I'm your host, John Aidan Byrne, and I hope you're all doing real well as we count down to Super Bowl Sunday in the United States and across the globe. Look, the Super Bowl is a national treasure. So is baseball, and we'll be talking in a wee moment to Major League Baseball legend, Todd Stottlemyre about his new self-help book, The Observer, disguised as a coming-off middle-aged novel wrapped in a sports story that underneath it all is actually a fable about pro baseball star Todd Stottlemyre's life. Sherlock, it's grand to have you back. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, We'll probably stay together. Probably? (laughs) It's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, Okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. My guest is baseball legend Todd Stottlemyre, who rose to superstardom, winning two World Series with the Toronto Blue Jays, and he has a new self-help book out called The Observer. I'm your host, John Aidan Byrne. Hey, Todd, welcome to my show. It's a great pleasure. And, you know, I'm going to start with Super Bowl Sunday, and then we'll get into your fascinating new book that just came out and your career in baseball. And you'll tell us more about yourself. Any thoughts about the game with the Chiefs and Tampa Bay? I mean, to me, I'm sort of, I, I won't call myself an outsider. I grew up on the other side of the pond in Ireland, 
we had the Irish version, Gaelic football, and of course we had soccer, two beautiful games. So I had to get that out of the way when I came to America. I've been here many years and my, my family are big football fans. We've great teams in the New York area, Jets and Giants. Unfortunately, they didn't make it this year. But what, what's your thoughts? I mean, to me, Tom Brady is a star. He's epic. Just look at 10 Super Bowls. I mean, that's just incredible. It's it really is uh, unbelievable. And John, thanks for having me on your show. And and, you know, you look at Tom Brady's going to his 10th Super Bowl. And I got to tell you, there's a lot to learn there. So and and really, when you take a look at it, it's like you got a guy going to his 10th Super Bowl and then you got a guy coming off of a Super Bowl, won an MVP and and he's that young rising star. Right. And and not really rising. He's a star today. And and Patrick Mahomes. But think about it. It's like. You know, one um, in Tom Brady, it's not about talent so much. It's about his work ethic. It's about his preparation. And of course, he's got some talent, but he's not the most talented quarterback in the NFL. And he's not the most talented quarterback ever to play in the NFL. But he's doing things as a quarterback in the NFL that have never been done. That's a great lesson for all of us. So it's going to be an exciting game. Uh, it's the young, I guess, against... Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say Tom Brady, the old, because he might play another five or 10 years. Who knows? I mean, he's defying odds for sure. Yeah, it's an extraordinary story. Well, your story is in Major League Baseball, but just quickly on Brady again. I mean, I just wonder how much of it is mind over matter or is it sort of modern training? I mean, he's an amazing character to study. Well, I just, I you said it right there, to study. And I think that um, he provides something in the public for us all to watch and and to watch him fail, to watch him win, to watch him prepare, um, to watch him kind of go through his game. I, I love to watch him come off the field after their offense is done and when the cameras will scan on him. And what is he doing? He's over there looking at the iPad, studying his past performances. I talk about this all the time. And as he studies those past performances, he's looking for missed opportunities that he might not have witnessed while he was out on the field. So he's a continuous study. He's always trying to get better. He's always looking for an edge. And then he does it with a great spirit where he's so humble. I loved in the championship mm -hmm. game afterwards, they were interviewing him, interviewing him up there on the up on the podium. And he said, hey, let's get some other guys up here. I mean, man, that was to me, it gave me goosebumps because I'm like, it wasn't all about him. But he was saying, let's get the other guys up here. They were important in, in this run to, to the Super Bowl. And he, he wanted his team to be glorified and not to be all about him. So there's something to say about that professional. Well, it's not what team sports really are at heart. Team sports. It's about community, about sharing. And he exemplified that by saying, hey, get some of the other guys up here to the microphone. It was so awesome. I just thought, you know, it's true to his character. And, and you know, uh, you know, I, I think he's gone through um, and all the stardom and, and all of the the press and the media and being out in the public eye. I just think he's done it um, in such a professional manner. Um, you know, somebody definitely to admire, to look up to and to learn from. Yeah, it's going to be a great game. So the Chiefs and the Tampa Bay taking on the odds on either team. I just think it's hard. To, you know, it's so hard. It's so difficult here. I, you know, once again, you got Patrick Mahomes and you got the Kansas City Chiefs who are so talented and got such a great team. But at the and then you look at the other side and you're like, wow, you know, people were watching the Bucks all year long. Are they going to come together as a team? Are they going to get this thing together? And, you know, they've gotten hot at the right time and it seemed to be uh, gelling and coming together at the right time and ha have played incredible football through the playoffs. So always tough to bet against Brady, but uh, I, I just think it's going to be a great game. I hope it comes down to the last two minutes. Yeah, exactly. That that creates a lot of excitement. And even if you're not a football fan, as you said, our household here. We're big fans, but even folks who don't follow football, you want you want it to go to the end. It adds that extra sparkle to the game. For sure, for sure, and and uh, you know uh, it'll be to me it'd be it'd be awesome to see uh, Brady with his hands on the football and and uh, you know with a minute left and and having to find a way to score to to overcome the Chiefs. So, um, but anyways, uh, I'm looking <laughs> for the I, I, I'm looking for the dramatic. 
<laughs> yeah, amen. Todd, you are a former Major League Baseball pitcher. You played 15 seasons, most notably as a member of the Toronto Blue Jays, with whom you won two World Series championships. You also played for the Oakland Athletics, St. Louis Cardinals, Texas Rangers, and the Arizona Diamondbacks, and you have numerous awards. But you have a great backstory and have had a career after your professional sports career. Uh, you have a new book out. And so tell us about the book, and then maybe we'll sort of get into what you did after you left Major League Baseball. Yeah, very good. So I'll, I'll kind of back into it. And, and you know, there was a reason I wanted to write this book. And and for me, it was I wanted to share a message. And the message was really my mess. And and it was, you know, my setbacks that I had to I had to find a way to overcome. And and, um, you know, I'll go to 1993 and and, you know, I'm a young play, pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays. We we literally had just won our second world championship. Um, and, and we'd won back to back, we'd won in 92 and now we're, here we go. We won in 93. And if you look at my childhood, you know, I grew up in a place called Yankee stadium with my father, Mel Stottlemyre, who was a legend and a legendary pitcher for the New York Yankees. So growing up at the stadium and having a dream and then living it out. And I'm not only living it out now, I'm playing on great teams that are winning world championships. I'm in my twenties. I'm making millions of dollars. And if you would have looked at me from the outside, you'd have been like, this guy's got it all. I mean, had a dream, grew up in Yankee Stadium, living out the dream, winning world championships, making millions. He's in his 20s. There was a problem, John. And the, and the problem for me was when I looked in the mirror, I couldn't stand the guy looking back at me. And the reason for that was that 12 years prior to that 1993 moment, I was 15 years old. My little brother was 11. He was on his third bout of leukemia. And, um, you know, the doctors told our family his only chance for long term survival was a bone marrow transplant. Uh, I was the perfect match, uh, gave him the bone marrow. Um, that bone marrow eventually put him into a coma that eventually took his life. And and obviously it was tragic for our family. And can you imagine? Um, and I'm sure there's some listeners out there that have had to go through similar situations. But, you know, for a parent to, and for for my mom and dad to have to bury their 11 year old son, it just didn't seem right. And and then for me, you know, all the sadness of losing my brother four, four and a half years younger than me. And and but the trauma of feeling the guilt that my marrow had something to do with it. And I also carried the emotion of hate. <clears throat> and the problem was after the 93 World Series, you know, I started to reflect and really take a strong look at myself. And what I realized that mentally and emotionally, I kept ending up in the same place on the field and off the field. You know, I'd have these explosions and these blackouts and all this hate and all this guilt would come to the surface when I couldn't control something. And really what it was doing was ruin the mastery of the moment. See, I was living in the prison that I built. That prison was called unforgiveness. And, and uh, you know, I, I got to a point in my life where I was just sick and tired of emotionally responding and feeling the same way over and over. I reached out for help. I called a guy by the name of Harvey Dorfman. Uh, he was kind of the mindset guru of Major League Baseball. And I said, Harvey, I called him. I said, hey, Harvey, Todd Stottlemyre. He goes, I've been waiting on your call. I was funny because I didn't even know he knew who I was. And I said, Harvey, I need help. He goes, I know. And we booked a meeting that was supposed to last a couple hours. Um, then it ended up lasting 12 hours in a hotel room where we laughed, we cried, we rejoiced. It was just unbelievable. But, you know, in that first hour, he asked me a very important question. He says, Todd, would you do it again? I said, Harvey, do what again? And he says, would you give a bone marrow transplant to your little brother? I said, Harvey, I'd do it every minute. I'd do it every of every hour. I'd do it of every day. I'd do it over and over. I'd do whatever I had to do. He says, didn't you already do that? And I said, yeah. He said, Todd, he says, did you do everything you could do? I said, yes. He's looked at me and he said, Todd, he says, you didn't kill your little brother. He says, it's time to let it go, man. He said, you've already done everything you can do. And at that moment, man, I broke down and I broke down because it was the first time somebody had confronted me. And in that conference in, in, and by him confronting me, he also he lent me the permission to forgive myself, to move on. And it was it was it was life changing for me. And it was like I realized in that moment 
that my emotional breakdowns and stress and guilt and hate and the way I was acting was stemming from a tragic that 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 was 12 years early. And what the problem with it was, I continued to replay it over and over and over. And as I replayed that tragic event over and over and over in my mind and in my heart, it started to become who I was. Harvey said to me in the last hour of that conversation, he said, Todd, he said, for the next seven days, and this is really the making of the book, he says, I don't want you to respond to anything. He said, if something grabs your mind, your mental thoughts, your attention, or your heart, your emotions, you start to get a little bit unwound. He says, I don't, I don't want you to respond or react to anything in the next seven days. He says, I want you to observe your thoughts. I want you to observe your emotions. And I want you to not respond. I want you to document. He goes, in seven days, we're going to build you a tool chest. And we're going to build you a tool chest that's going to allow you not to not to cripple yourself emotionally in moments of things you can't control. I'm going to help you not only get into peak performance, but be able to stay there no matter what happens. He says, you, we have to understand we so many things when we start trying to control the uncontrollable or have no power of it, then when we start to do that, then that moment in time starts to identify who we are and what's going on on the inside of us. And prior to that moment, what was going on in the inside of me? Hate, guilt, anger, frustration, fear. It was crazy. So it was really the making of, of the book. And, you know, since that time, it's, it's been a study for me. It's been an ongoing process and, 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 uh, and through a lot of help with a lot of people. I was able to overcome that moment and and really just rewire myself into a different person with a different perspective, with a different way of thinking and becoming the observer. And, um, you know, I wanted to, to deliver it to people because I know there's people out there. And if you look at our world in 2020, how, how about all the hate? How about all the anger? How about all the frustration? And uh, so I'm hoping people will pick up the book and and it'll be life changing for them, just like it was life changing for me. That moment in the hotel room where you had that very long, deep discussion, you had some laughter and you unloaded and confessed. That was the turning point in your life. Yeah, big time. I mean, it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life. It, it changed the perspective of my life. And, and uh, you know, there's something that's important that kind of goes along with it is, see, I wanted help. And I wanted help because I was frustrated because emotionally and mentally, I kept ending up in the same place. And, and, and what I mean by that is my thoughts and my emotions were holding me back from being as good as I could be. And I realized it. So I was aware of it. So, you know, by Harvey helping me and giving me tools and, and going through that session, and, but it was ongoing, you know, we talked every week all, all year long. So it wasn't like it was a one-time fix. It was like there were plenty of times it was two steps forward, a step back. I would tell you all to all the listeners today, I still fail at all the things that I'm teaching. I'm st I still fail at the story. The beauty is I have a tool chest that I can go into and I can take myself, my mental and emotional states with my tool chest. And if I don't like the way I'm feeling or thinking, I, can, I know I have the power to change those thoughts and change those feelings. And that's very powerful. So it doesn't last a week any longer. It doesn't last a month or a week or it doesn't last a day. Sometimes and, and sometimes it's like maybe one or two minutes or five minutes or 30 minutes. But then I'll realize it through clarity and awareness of these thoughts and emotions. And then I'm be and I'm able to empower myself to change that state of thinking and feeling because of the tool chest. Todd, prior to your encounters with Harvey and the ongoing sessions and therapy, you were carrying those wounds inside you, manifesting in outbursts and anger throughout your career and childhood? Yeah. So from the time I was 15, uh, uh, you know, my mother and father said that, you know, I went from this laid back kid to this kid that was kind of out of control, um, you know, and 
And it was like, you know, that, that, that leaving that hospital and looking at my brother as he took his last breath and, and leaving at that hospital and the, it was overwhelming the feeling of that my marrow was what put him into a coma. And for me, I, I couldn't let that go. And um, for me, it was hard to even look at my mother and father um, feeling that the burden of that guilt and that hate that and feeling that burden. And and uh, and even though I did everything I could and even though it was out of my control and even though I couldn't play God, I was 15. And at 15, all I could think about was it was my marrow. So I, I began to just literally... <laughs> you know, just beat myself up and, and play the, once again, play these events over and over and over. And as I was doing it, I, all I was doing was rewiring the person that I was becoming. I was becoming a person of guilt and hate and unforgiveness. And it was brutal. Well, what is remarkable is you went on to have a great career in Major League Baseball. So it didn't impact your performance or how did it intersect with all of that? How could you focus? Yeah. So what's odd is that, you know, I played on great teams in Toronto, but I never really pitched to, you know, my potential or, or, you know, I was, I, I never got there. But, you know, if you look at, it's funny because if you look at the meeting I had in the winter of 1993 or the spring of 1994, before the 1994 season, if you look at my numbers and the type of pitcher I was from 1988 through 1993, and then you compare those numbers against 1994 to the end of my career, it's night and day. And, uh, you know, and it was, it had a lot, it had so much to do with being in control in the moment of my thoughts and of my emotions and being, and being able to control that so that I could stay and allow myself to stay in a place of focus, in the zone, in a place of peak performance, so that I could perform at the best of my ability on that given day. But in life too, you know, think about in life is like, how, how many times do people focus on things they can't control? And it frustrates the hell out of them. You know, it's like, you know, all, I mean, if you, if you just take a look at 2020 and it's like, and, and, and how emotionally, how, how, how you, all of your emotional strings, you know, would be touched by the race war in 2020, by the political war in 2020, by the COVID war in 2020. And, and go back and reflect of how are you thinking and how are you feeling as these things are transpiring? And yet it's out of your personal control, but yet it becomes controlling of you. Did you do a lot of bad things during your years when you had that anger inside you? And what were they? You know, they were outbursts, you know, it could have been, you know, so, I mean, I wasn't out breaking any laws or doing anything morally, ethically that way. It was, it was anger. It was frustration that would come to the surface um, anytime I couldn't control an outcome that I was trying to, you know, I'm just like, you know, for me professionally, you know, as a major league player on the field, I wanted to perform better. I was like, man, I'm better than this. Um, but then personally off the field, um, you know, I could have those same outbursts of things that I couldn't control. And, and sometimes maybe treat someone that, you know, later on, I'd, I'd feel guilty for the way I treated them or the way I made them feel or the way I called them out. And, and I was like, man, I don't want to be that person. You know, I don't want to be the person that when I leave the room, everyone's happy I left the room. I wanted to be the person that when I left the room, people were happy I was there for a moment. I wanted to be that person. Any substance abuse? No. Mm -mm. Well, that's no. great. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned God uh, earlier. Are you a spiritual person? Are you a religious person? So I'll say I'm a, you know, we're, we're Christian by faith and I would say we're spiritual people. Um, um, religious sounds too uh, elementary to me. Like it's like, it's a ritual, not, not that I want to put a definition on it, but I'll, I'll say we're very spiritual people. Yeah. So there's a higher power right there in your uh, mind. No question about it. Yeah. I asked what kind of family she wanted. She said, a family like yours. 
Learn more about adopting a teen at AdoptUSKids.org. You can't imagine the reward. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. My guest is baseball legend Todd Stottlemyer, who rose to superstardom, winning two World Series with the Toronto Blue Jays, and he has a new self-help book out called The Observer. I'm your host, John Aidan Byrne. Todd, tell us about the book. It's I, I started to to read some of the reviews and, and it, it got me, it gripped me. I, it's it, it seems like a must read for a lot of people. Well, you know, it was uh, I would tell you it was it was a huge challenge. First of all, I'm not really a writer as far as like it's not like I have this gift of writing, you know. Um, so it was a challenge for me. It was my second book, and and this time I wrote it as a fable. I wanted it to be a story and. And, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to take some of my true life events and intertwine them inside the story with these characters. And at the same time, um, give them the principles and the models of success and peak performance that I acquired um, from my environments, that I acquired from my father, Mel Sotomar, that I acquired from Tony La Russa, Cito Gaston, uh, some of these tools that I acquired from Harvey Dorfman, as I spoke earlier, some of the tools that I acquired from some of the Hall of Fame teammates that I played with um, that I got a chance to learn from. Um, and, and so I intertwined the tools and the lessons inside the story based on true some true life events. You know, I had a guy one time, he asked me, he says, why didn't you just write it as a memoir? And I said, because I wanted it to be more relatable. You know, the main character is a woman. There's another character in the book that's a 15-year-old son. And then there's another character in the book that is the main character's father. And the, and the father played Major League Baseball, went on to coach and be a manager and general. And he was a very wise guy, like my father. It was an opportunity for me to be more relatable to everyone else by using it as a fable, intertwined in my stories inside of these characters. So What's odd is sometimes I'm the son, sometimes I'm the mom, and sometimes I'm the grandpa. And, and I just intertwined my life stories and lessons and things I had to overcome through these characters to try to make it relatable to everyone that picks up the book. Well, it's a work of fiction in part, right? Uh, but it's yeah. also a self-help book. Yeah, for sure. For sure. There's so many. There's over 50 success principles and models in the book. And, and, you know, I always warn people too. It's like, look, this is what works for me. And I always tell people, I go, look, and I'm still working on it, by the way. It's not like I've mastered every principle and model in the book. I still fail at them. And as I, as I said before, I said, but they're also not one shoe fits all. It might, that, that model or that principle or that thought or that mindset or that thought process might not work exactly for everyone, but it's but it's an example. It's a foundation of taking the step forward um, to gaining momentum to try to pursue the potential and the gifts that you've been granted. Now, you didn't write this book to make money because you have money. You've had remarkable success. You even went on to have a career on Wall Street um, after your sports career. Yeah, you know, it's funny is, you know, I'm in my mid fifties. I'm 55 today. You start thinking about, you know, leaving behind, you know, it's like you start, uh, you know, I watched two years ago, January, you know, I watched my father take his last breath mm. and, and, you know, he was, for me, he was our hero, you know, to my brothers and me. And, and he was our best friend and he was our mentor and he was our coach. And he left one hell of a legacy behind. And, you know, his legacy lives in my heart today is, as I share stories about him and what he meant to our family and what he meant to so many people in the, in, in the baseball world. And, you know, it puts you in a place where you start reflecting and reevaluating on your life. It's like, you know, so for this book, it's obviously it's not about money. It's about service. It's about, you know, I, I want my kids to understand, you know, when they read the book, some of the pain points I went through. And I want the readers to understand that it wasn't like, you know, I tell people all the time, I was born the son of a major league baseball player. But see, I wasn't born a major league player, though. I was born the son of one. 
Mm-hmm. But to become one, I had to go do the work. And, and in going and doing the work, there was pain, there was suffering, there was setbacks, there were trials, there were failures. And so I want people to know that whatever they want to accomplish, well, however bigger their dreams are, look, there's going to be setbacks, there's going to be some failures, <laughs> there's going to be some disappointment. And I had all of those things too. And these tools that I got a chance to learn from coaches and mentors and players and managers and some great people that were performing at the highest levels, I boiled them down into this story so people could have a tool chest for their greatness. So it's about service and it's about legacy. You mentioned your dad um, being famous. Were you walking in his shadows? Did you have to prove yourself a little bit extra goody, extra mile? How did that impact your career decisions, how you went about your life? Well, you know, I, I, I would say the first thing is, is that um, because he was so admired in the baseball world, I probably got an extra look because of that, um, you know, from scouts and that sort of thing. And so my opportunity, the window of opportunity might have been a little bit larger uh, because of those environments. But I still had to go do the work and still had to prove myself and still had to go do all those things. My, my father's uh, greatness, you know, we were my brothers and I were told. Uh, our whole childhood that we weren't like our father and people with the opinions of other people was something we had to learn to overcome. And I would tell you, my mother and my father, um, you can't pick your parents, but I got great ones because they helped us overcome the negative opinion of the world by focusing as young as young children. Just And my mother and father would always say, you know, you guys, whatever your dreams are, be the best you can be. You need to be authentically you, not your father. So, you know, even though it was a, a huge shadow, big shoes to follow in, you know, he was always saying, be you, you know, I'm, I'm me. And I tell my kids all the time today, I, I kind of transfer that lesson uh, down to the next generation. And I tell them, I say, look, don't be me. <laughs> I said, you can be so much more than me by being you. I'm already taken. <laughs> I've, I've already done it all. And, and I tell him, I say, look, I'm already taken and, and I'm living my life. But in order for you to be the best, you have to be the best version of you. You have to be your authentic self. And my parents did a great job of that. And because of that, we were, we were able always to overcome uh, the negative opinion of other people. What do you make of American society today? It's very polarized. You mentioned anger. There's a lot of anger out there, and we've heard calls for unity. But just look at the past 12 months, riots on the streets, neighbors fighting neighbors, metaphorically at least. Uh, how can the country come together? Why is there so much anger out there? Well, you know, anger is, you know, it's funny. It's like, <laughs> uh, where's that anger coming from, right? And I always say it comes from within. Um, but, I, you know, listen, I have hope and I'm an optimistic person. I believe this will pass. I believe this too shall pass. Um, you asked an important question is how are we going to overcome it? Um, you know, it's we got to we got to we got to get grounded again on the golden rule. And what's the golden rule? Treat others how you want to be treated. You know, the golden rule should actually be a law that you're not allowed to treat someone else how you don't want to be treated. And if we can just get back to the core of that and and it's OK, by the way, as human beings and, and, and it's OK to have a different opinion, it's OK to have a different understanding and instead of me hating you for your opinions, and instead of me hating you for what you believe, how about if I tried to have more understanding of how you got to that belief level? There's so much to learn from one another, but we're not going to learn that. And we're not going to learn these things. And we're not going to better our communities hating on one another, attacking one another, creating violence on one another. We need to create understanding of one another. But you're optimistic for the future that this will pass and we will come together. We'll overcome. We've overcome so many, you know, this. Look, you know, we probably look at this today and we say, man, this is the worst time in American history. I don't, I don't know. I think that can be argued. I think if you can go back and, and look at the race wars in the 60s, 
And you can look at the riots then. I mean, you can go back in time and in our country's short history and say, you know, we've been through some difficult times as a country. And I believe that we'll come through this one and we'll be better because of it. But even when we come out of this, will there be trying times ahead? Of course. There will always be bumps in the road. And for the people that don't believe that there'll be bumps in the road in the future as you overcome, are living in fan- they're living in the fantasy world. There's always going to be setbacks. There's always going to be trials and tribulations. It's a part of what we got to go through. It's called life. Human nature. Amen to that. that. I want to go back to The Observer, your new book. Many books on self-help and related topics often end up parroting the same principles. What makes your book different? Yeah, you nailed it. Um, Everything comes from somewhere, (laughs) at some place it originated. Um, I think it's perspective. I think it's taken something a certain mindset, naming it, giving it a perspective. My perspective um, is, is, is about my experiences. So I I don't, you know, I want to be very careful how I answer this question because I, and look, that I believe the greatest success and self-help book in the world is the Bible. And, And I, and I believe that if you go in and just study Proverbs, you can come up with all the lessons to live by and live a wise life and live a great sound life. Um, but I, I think that all of the self-help books, and you said it, you know, most of them, they, there was a thought someone had that, and, and in that original form, someone went through an experience and gave the original form a, a, maybe a slightly different perspective. For me, um, I teach nothing I've, that I'll never teach something I haven't experienced. So when someone reads my book, they can understand that it's like, wow, I went through that war. I went through that setback. Hey, I went through that pain. Hey, I was able to overcome it because of this or that or what have you. Once again, it's like, you know, there's no question in a lot of the self-help books, just something originated somewhere that is, is, is expanded on. But for me, you know, I only teach what I've experienced and, and then go from there. Self-help, you know, when you think of self-help, you know, can, can people can be like, ah, I said, wait a minute, understand what is self-help? <laughs> self-help is basically, it's you working on you. It's you trying to get better. It's you becoming a student uh, of life. It's becoming a student of your thoughts. It's becoming a student of your emotions. It's becoming a student of your state of being. It's becoming a student of your performance. That's self-help. If I, if I go back and I watch a film on an old game that I pitched because I'm going to try to learn something, that's self-help. You mentioned Bible and scripture. Did any of that inform your writing as you put your thoughts to paper to publish The Observer? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, bibl- it's biblical. You know, people talk about it all the time that you become your thoughts, right? We've heard this a million times. That's Listen, that's written in the Bible. <laughs> So uh, you become your thoughts. So, you know, so how many thousands of years ago um, did, did something originate somewhere, right, that, that um, now is biblical, that now is showing up in self-help books everywhere? And, and listen, there, there's a reason for it, too, and it's powerful, and it's an understanding that it's like, how, how come that is the way? Because that's where our focus is. And wherever our focus and attention goes, all of our energy flows towards that focus. And we start to become that. We start to become the creator of those thoughts. It's interesting to listen to you and describe your book and your motivations to write it. I recently interviewed a young woman on the West Coast who set up a home for mothers in crisis and for their children, you know, a shelter for them, get take them away from the street and so on. And she herself had a difficult background. She lived on the streets and abused drugs. And but now she's clean and everything, married a wonderful man who's a successful business person. But she said to me, there's no greater high to her today than helping other people. That's that's the high she gets. You don't need drugs. You don't need alcohol. Helping people, that's what it's all about. Yeah, you know, I listen, I applaud that because, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how much 
Uh, for me, I get so much energy inward when I'm helping someone else. <laughs> it's like I don't get near that energy um, when I'm trying to maybe do something for me. I get 10 times more energy when I'm trying to help someone else. And, you know, look, think about it. She And, and, and the way you told it was she was on the street doing drugs and 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 she had to over she overcome that. She see she overcame her mess, and now it's her ministry. So now she's helping others um, have a better life. And and it's like that's so powerful. By the way, uh, we were talking about it early. How are we going to overcome all the hate and the riots and everything with people just like that lady? That's how it. That's how it happens. <laughs> One person time, someone making a decision that, hey, I'm going to help somebody overcome what I had to overcome so they don't have to continue to go through the pain that I once went through. It's service. It's humanity. Yeah, I would add to that, Todd, that we need an honest debate in America about what ails us and and it's not filtered in a way that we're misguided. That's very important um, we could take a closer look at how media disseminates news, but that's almost another episode. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of fun with that one, couldn't we? <laughs> we certainly, I could have you back to discuss that. Um, so what would success look like to you in publishing The Observer? How will you measure, I've had a successful release and I'm happy the way this was received uh, in America and around the world? I mean, I've already received so many texts and emails and things on social media that, um, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm so uh, honored too that, you know, there's been a lot of people say, hey, I read through the book and I couldn't put it down. And and now I'm reading through it a second time and underlining it and gain it and getting all the principles. So, um, you know, a lot of people buy books and put them on the shelf and never read them. So I'm grateful that anybody that has pur- purchased a book has actually read the book and, and, and to have these emails and texts and, and have people say, man, I needed this. And I'm like, wow. Right. And, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm so grateful um, um, that I was able to provide something that they needed. That's, that's the service piece of this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have any outwardly aspirations for it, you know, um, certain list, this and that, where does it go? Whatever. I will tell you that I'm doing everything I can to promote it because the stories in this book, uh, there were things I had to overcome that were life changing for me and it saved my life. And because of it, and because of some of the things and, and most of the, the principles and models in the book I got from someone else. It wasn't my original thought. It was people helping me where I was at. And now I want to do, I want to pass that on to other people. And then if it hits people where they're at and then becomes relatable to them and it can help them, then I will say that would be a work well done. So that's my hope. That's terrific. The Observer, and there's a subtitle, if you will, A Modern Fable on Mastering Your Thoughts and Emotions. It's your latest book, Todd. Stop, Lee Meyer. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Good luck with the book and enjoy the Super Bowl this coming Sunday. Absolutely, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's people like you um, that are doing greatness and, and allowing the message to get out. So I appreciate you allowing me to get my message out today. So I'm humbled and honored and it was great hanging out with you today, sir. You've been listening to Life on Planet Earth with John Aiden Byrne. To reach the host or learn about advertising or sponsorship opportunities, call 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com. That's 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com. 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com.